All righty, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rare Petro Content. Today, we have episode five of the Industry Leader Spotlight. And today, I am joined by Jeffrey Can. Jeffrey Can is an oil and gas <laughs> advisor, presenter, and author with over 30 years of experience in the energy and technology sectors. Mr. Can's book, Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, addresses why the oil and gas industry must adopt more digital innovations and how leaders must act to accelerate digitization. As an expert on leveraging technology to create value in oil and gas, his understanding of the importance of digital awareness applies to all facets of upstream and downstream within the oil industry. Thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here. All righty. So first, to kick it off, we ask everybody, how did you get into the industry? There's got to be a beginning. There's got to be a start. Where did it kick <laughs> off? Well, I, I decided to devote my life to the energy industry in 1995, precisely. And uh, at that time, I was living in Hong Kong, but working in China and um, uh, specifically on a project for General Motors in a, 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 a city called Baichang, which I know you've never heard of. But um, you have to picture this if you would. So downtown Baichang, two million people, lots of pedestrians, lots of bicycles, not a car in sight. <laughs> people are getting their. Uh, energy delivery by donkey cart, lumps of coal delivered door to door. The hotel we're staying at had no front door. It was open right out to the street. And Baichang, by the way, in Chinese translates to white city. And that's because it's in the north and where it snows a lot. So imagine a hotel where the lobby is open right out to the street. No heat. And at night, there was so little hot water available that the guests would gather in the lobby of the hotel and we would take turns trying to find our time slot to have a shower. And you only had four minutes. So I had my, I had my four minute slot. I waited two days to get my shower and I get into the shower and um, it's nothing but uh, cold water. Fortunately, the hotel had delivered this really large insulated thermos of hot water so that you could make tea. It's China after all. And so I, I took a smell of it and it smelled a little off, but that, that was okay. I decided I would get into the shower, take, rinse off in cold water, and then I would lather up and then I would pour the hot water from the thermos and I would rinse off. And so I get in, I lather up, I pour the hot water and you know what? It's not hot water, it's hot tea. <laughs> now I'm covered head to toe in soap suds and, and uh, wet tea leaves. And I smell like a cross between oolong cha and a really irritated shih tzu. <laughs> so here, you know, General Motors, I was working for GM at the time. General Motors thinks they're going to sell these people cars. But I looked at a billion people in energy poverty. And I said, you know what? These people heat their homes with, uh, co with coal. At night, the coal fog was so dense, you'd think you're in London in the 1950s. The hotels aren't heated. And if you're a tourist, you're going to take a bath in hot tea, not have a hot shower. So it was at that point that I said, you know what? I'm going to devote my career to bringing energy to the world, driven entirely by that experience. Just born out of negative context. That's, I've got to say, it's probably the most interesting one we've had so far. <laughs> it was great fun at the time, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> From the beginning, uh, of course, this is Industry Leader Spotlight. Where in your career do you think you differentiated yourself from just an entrepreneur to definitely business leader, leader of the industry? Uh, well, in, in my context, it was being a, a partner in, in a large professional services organization. And again, it was back to a, a, a different time and a different era. In uh, a roughly two, 1990, let me go back in time now, 2000 and... 2006, 2007, somewhere in there. So it was after the Enron debacle and the dot-com blow up uh, in the turn of the century and 9-11, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, turn of the century. And uh, at that time, Deloitte was not structured in, 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 towards industries. People basically worked on any industry. And, uh, and as I said, I, I had seen the future. The future was going to be bringing energy to billions of people. So I was living in Calgary and it was, at, at, it was at, at that time that I said, you know what, I'm going to devote my career inside Deloitte as a partner focused on the oil and gas industry. 
and even prior to that point, uh, I had was still working in public sector and manufacturing and other. But it was uh, it was it was, it was that it was at that that uh, pivotal moment when Lloyd said, "You know what? We're we're going to restructure ourselves around industries," and I decided that I would then focus on the oil and gas sector. And I haven't looked back since. I've worked in uh, industries, you know, in, in different industries from time to time outside of oil and gas. But for the most part, for the for that a whole time period, it's been basically just the one industry. Definitely multifaceted in talents, it seems. And then also, I think that brings us to te- present day, starting from the hot tea shower through tea career shower. through there. <laughs> And then today, and we're experiencing what a lot would consider, and I think would be correct in analyzing, a downturn. How does this downturn compare to the ones you've seen in the past, or are they pretty all much all the same, or what factors differentiate this one? Well, this one's different in a couple of ways. Uh, So the first one is that normally when there's a downturn in oil and gas, uh, it's because there's some imbalance between supply and demand at at a quite fundamental level. And uh, so if you go back to the uh, downturn, um, I'm gonna, going from memory here, but back in the 1996-97 um, downturn, um, I'm old enough to know <laughs> I was around then. But back at that time, the, the reason the, the downturn took place was because there wasn't enough crude carriers to move the oil to market. And so it got bottled up on the continent and, and the price fell. As soon as we started to get the new crude carriers into the market, the price reset. So it's just a supply-demand balance. Sometimes it's an infrastructure issue. This time though, what's different is that we've had the combined effects of the pandemic, which triggered governments to go into a lockdown, which caused the economies to contract, which has reduced the demand. And at the very same time, if the um, Russia and OPEC got together and said, you know what, we've had enough uh, market share loss relative to uh, the uh, shale uh, plays in North America, and we're gonna put a stop to that, and we're gonna do that by flooding the market with oil and causing the price to go down. So you have the double effect of both demand contraction and excess supply. Normally it's just one or the other, this time it's both. And that's what makes this uh, quite a unique um, scenario uh, for, for, for those of us who have a lot of experience in the industry, is how do you, how do you fix two, both demand and supply, and get them get them righted back so so that the market uh, then comes back into balance. That that is a unique feature of this particular downturn. Yeah, definitely unique. But now we've got, like you said, unique problem. What are the unique solutions you're seeing, either with the businesses you work with or just observing from the general public? How are people navigating this? Well, it's it's really challenging because the the repair to the demand side is out of the industry's control. It's not like the industry can um, uh, uh, create demand for a product like uh, the oil and gas industry, our our product, petroleum product. Our product goes into other industries. And so so what's what's required to fix uh, the demand problem is to get our economies back working again and working the way they were in in transportation, logistics, uh, uh, travel, entertainment, tourism, all the things that have a driver effect on on the demand side. Industry has no influence over that. That's driven by governments and policy. Mm-hmm. On the supply side though, uh, what, what uh, uh, com- companies and uh, uh, national economies have been doing is they've been saying to the producers, you're gonna have to trim production so that we get the, the supply down closer to where the demand is at, which will in, in turn help accelerate the recovery in prices. And so that's a major, major change. Normally in a downturn like this, uh, you don't have coordinated efforts um, uh, and as much pressure to switch off production the way we have. We've taken a million barrels a day out of Canada. There's a million, at least, out of the United States. Uh, the, the Russians, the OPEC, have all taken millions and millions of barrels out of production uh, in a relatively coordinated way in a really short time period, just like literally 30 days, 40 days. It's been a huge, huge shift in, on, the, on the supply side. Now, but that also creates the conditions, I think, in North America, certainly, where companies who are producers today will look to the future to say, well, how can we produce differently? Can we anchor in some cost reductions right now so that when, the, when and if the price starts to go back up, we can retain those cost savings and, and get them embedded into the business? And that's a key driver that the industry is, you know, many companies in the industry are focusing on right now. So it seems like people are trying to target whatever is in their control because 
quite quickly they realize demand is not necessarily something you can influence at this point. Yep, exactly right. Can't do anything about that. What can you can control, and and that's what you should go. The, that's what companies are going after. And mm -hmm. you can see it's kind of a standard playbook when when oil, uh, supply and demand get out of, out of whack in oil and gas. You 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 go to your suppliers and you ask them for price concessions. You high grade your capital spend. So projects that were you know didn't have the highest possible return, you stop investing in those and set those to the side. Uh, you, you will uh, reduce your staff load at levels. And you can see lots and lots of layoffs now starting to happen throughout the industry. You'll trim the dividend and say, you know what, I'm not going to pay the dividend this uh, this year. I'm going to reduce the dividend uh, payment. So there's lots of things that, that industry does in a standard fashion when it gets into a downturn. What's different about this downturn, though, is that there's a new lever that the industry can pull on to reset its costs. And that lever is digital innovation. Those are the possibilities of injecting new ways of doing business into oil and gas uh, that once put into place will capture benefits permanently and then they can keep those benefits when and if the price uh, comes back. And that's segued into the next question perfectly because I would like to ask, <laughs> you've covered past, present, and now going to the future, what do you think will be born out of this downturn? Will it be new policies or will it lean pretty heavily towards digital tech innovations? Well, in the context of um, the, the downturn, we've already seen some quite specific and, and quite substantial changes that oil and gas companies have had to institute simply to continue their operations as an essential service. And social distancing is, is a clear one. Uh, and that, from that, uh, everything from uh, split shifts in office towers to lots more uh, home working. Um, the, the, the number of employees who have left office, downtown office towers are continuing to work now work from home is, is extraordinary. When you, when you think about it, e even if four months ago, if you'd said to literally any oil company in the world, by the way, come Monday, we're all going to be working from home. Most oil executives would have said, no, there's not a chance that's going to happen. And yet it happened. And so the lights, light switch is now on. The industry is now saying, well, we were able to turn on a dime. What can we now put into place that we can hold on to? Uh, the biggest one clearly is the social distancing and work from home policy. This raises into question, how much real estate does an oil and gas company actually need to have in downtown office towers? Uh, with, with that, how do we put, and a number of my clients have talked to me about this, what do I need to do with my, to my, my particular service or technology that I sell to oil and gas, how can I reconfigure that so that I can put into place institutionally social distancing capabilities? Now, so what does that mean? Well, imagine you're a SCADA system vendor and you've designed your SCADA system so that it requires two operators at a time in a control room. Well, that's not gonna fly in the pandemic world. So the next generation of SCADA systems will now be being built such that they can build social distancing directly into the design. And that's a big change, because that, that would never have been a, even a requirement uh, six months ago. Now it's going to be business as usual. And then kind of going back to what you were saying, in a very short time frame, telling everybody, we're all going to be working from home, and everyone said no. It does seem like yeah. there's that initial pushback. And I was reading a post on your website talking about the hedgehogs of the industry. So yep. how exactly, what, what percentage of the industry today is hedgehogs and how much pushback will there be from people who want to operate the old way, the way it always worked? Well, in part, the, the, the uh, concept of a hedgehog, I mean, just to elaborate for those who might not have read the article around a hedgehog. So a hedgehog is this, is this cute little creature <laughs> Uh, with spines like a porcupine, and when they're threatened, they curl into a ball, and the, the spines all stick out, and makes the uh, this critter really, really hard to uh, to eat. If you're a wolf or a hungry fox or something, um, it also means they're very impervious to change. The, if you think about it as a you know some some managers in the industry will curl into a ball, refuse to embrace change, and stick all these quills out, making it really hard to engage with them. So, how many are in industry like this? I would I would I would phrase it slightly differently. I would say how much of the asset base in oil and gas is itself hedgehog-like in that it runs 24 seven, it's steel and cement, it's highly regulated. So even if you want to make change, you got to deal with a regulator. Uh, and it, has, uh, it deals with hazardous volatile product that is explosive or is, is an ex a, 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 a hazardous uh, product if it gets exposed to the environment. 
that infrastructure is what drives the hedgehogs to be very, very resistant to embrace change too quickly. And you know, quite frankly, as society, we're quite grateful for that, actually, because if oil and gas professionals just drop change into the field without thinking through the consequences, it could have really, really bad effects um, on, on, on us in society. Uh, so you know, we should embrace the hedgehogs. But on the other hand, much of the change that could potentially work because it's digitally based or software based or data based as opposed to cement and steel, those changes should be embraced more quickly than they are. And I would suggest that the vast majority of the managers in oil and gas who have to look after a physical asset that is hard to change often project onto digital that it is also hard. And that's just not true. Digital is far easier to change and work with. And so uh, what my advice to the hedgehogs out there is, yes, you should continue to protect that physical asset because of all the reasons I've sketched out. It sets danger and so forth. But on the digital side, you should embrace change much more quickly than you are. And speaking on embracing digital change, I mean, that it rolls off the tongue nice and easy, but that's kind of a broad topic. We have so many different technologies. What types of digital technologies and innovations will be easily accepted by the industry and which ones do you think will be most easily integrated or least e easily integrated with no results? Well, the, uh, the, the, the technology that the industry is, can see very clear line of sight to uh, its impact is the tool sets that are, go by the label artificial intelligence and machine learning. The industry is already blessed with ample supplies of data assets. And, uh, but doesn't have the tools to analyze the data in, to the same degree uh, that it has had in the past. And so the first and fastest uh, solution adoption in oil and gas is, and, and is around the application of these new interpretation and analytic tools to an existing large pile of data. The next um, uh, application, which is very uh, time sensitive now because it's, it's, uh, it, we're in a situation where there's value to be created, are the robotic tools that work on established business process. So it goes by the label of robotic process automation. Those tools can be very quickly adopted, relatively speaking, in oil and gas, and they have tremendous uh, impact. So those, those are the two that are what I would describe as fastest path to value, uh, um, artificial intelligence tool sets and robotic process tools to automate existing processes. The other technologies are, gonna, are harder to get at and take more change, more money, more capital to spend. Um, and so I, I would set those to the, you know, kind of lower down on the priority list. And, and I would concentrate my attention on the, those, those other, those two that I mentioned, AI, machine learning, and, and um, robotic process tools. And there's just so much digital information and knowledge available at people's fingertips with all of those things you've mentioned. So would those two categories, would you say, be the best jumping off point for someone interested in learning critical digitization skills? Or would you advise they start elsewhere? Well, it's a, if, if in terms of a very personal level, what I would observe is that all of these digital tools are growing at an exponential rate. And when things are growing at an exponential rate, it, uh, the, the human capacity to work with those tools lags. And uh, so for an individual who is interested in getting their career onto something that's moving quickly and creating a demand for skill set, is to align yourself with a technology that itself is already experiencing exponential or very rapid growth. And to the end of the, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which one, because they're all growing really, really quickly. Just pick one. So it could be cloud computing, blockchain, internet of things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic tools, process automation, uh, gamification. Any of those technologies are all growing like this ver vertically and creating uh, demand for know-how and insight. Individuals who can combine the two uh, domain knowledges, so those, these digital technology tools that are growing really rapidly and oil and gas are an exceptionally short supply. And so all you need to do in, in terms of a career choice is pick one, just pick one. <laughs> one you like, one that you find interesting. And what you'll find is that in, in, in very, very short order, you will be already leagues ahead of your peers because they're not as, as attuned to how these, these technologies are uh, changing. And you'll be in a great position to identify where they can be brought to bear in, in your company. 
So the digital oil field is almost a certain part in the future. And we've acknowledged what you can do as a professional at any stage in your career to enhance your understanding. But what can you do if you're maybe still in college? A lot of our listeners may be out there or recently graduated like myself a month ago. What can you do to differentiate yourself from the rest of your peers? Yeah, it's very, very challenging in the educational system because in, in, uh, in the educational world to inject a new course into the curriculum at, say, an engineering school. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't study engineering in school. I studied business. But what I remember was there was no time in the day for someone to shove yet another course into the curriculum. Something's going to have to come out for that to happen. And so it takes a long time for educational institutions to sort through what can we safely remove from the curriculum so that we can add digital innovation in or uh, one possible way, a uh, solution to the question. The other is how do we inject digital thinking into all of the different disciplines in, in say an engineering school and universities aren't landed yet as to precisely what the right answer is going to be. And you can imagine, you know, to get any, either of those you need, instructors, you need curriculum, you need certification, you need thinking around what is important. And meanwhile, digital is moving really, really quickly. So what, what students are feeling is that the education system has not prepared them adequately for the future. I think that's a, I've been told this over and over again by, by young people coming out of, out of the education system. Uh, so what is the resolution? Uh, challenging, but I, I believe the right answer is uh, take advantage of online learning opportunities that exist out there because that's what's left now. That's what you got to work with. And again, pick one of these digital tool sets and position yourself um, as, as, a, as a knowledgeable person on them. There's lots and lots of startups now looking for the combination of, say, blockchain plus oil and gas, artificial intelligence and oil and gas. You, you, you get, you've got one. Can you get the other? And once you've got the other one, can you then turn it into a, you know, a, a viable career? That's, that's how I would be tackling it. And I'd have to agree from you as someone who did go to an engineering school, only recently did they introduce uh, well, the data analytics program and they couldn't really prioritize what they wanted to keep and yeah. what they wanted to get rid of. So they <laughs> yeah. decided to make it a minor, but then the students yeah. would go, well, we're already taking 16 to 19 credit hours a semester. I don't have time for that. But the people yeah, who are taking advantage of it. They're yeah. excelling. I mean, that's the, the, that's, the, that's the dilemma in the education system. Like, you know, humans learn at a certain pace, and our education system is geared to learn at a certain, uh, develop curriculum and learn at a certain pace. And the, the challenge is digital is off kilter with that pace now. So uh, re reacting to it is, is a huge, huge challenge for all education uh, systems around the world. And then... In terms of industry, do you see these, the implementation of these innovations being driven by operators and refineries, service companies, salesmen, or even another third party? <laughs> well, they, the history of the industry is that innovation starts and originates with service companies. And the reason for that is that the service company's capital turns over quite quickly. Uh, if you, and by that I mean, if you're, say, a, a drilling company and you have a drill rig, your drill rig's only going to last you two or three seasons. And at the end of that, it's, it's so beat up that you, it's, it's basically scrap. So you're going to turn your capital over quite quickly, which gives you the opportunity to introduce innovation when you're replacing that capital. So the capital turnover drives the innovation cycle. And added to that, service companies actually have to compete for business. Oil companies don't compete necessarily for um, uh, oil markets. What they compete for is to get the resource underground. That's where they compete. Get the best in the right resource and figure out how to extract that resource at the right, right uh, cost point. Service companies, though, have to compete. And so they're innovating much more. A survey from uh, Robert Perrins, he's a professor in the University of Queensland, I think, uh, and his research shows that something like 90 or 95 percent of innovation in oil and gas originates in a service company who gets a trial or a pilot at an oil and gas company makes it work then the oil and gas company talks about this at a conference or a market white paper and then it gets picked up by oil company after oil company after oil company and so where 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 would you where's the best place to look for innovation if you want to if you want to be at the edge and, and very edgy and you know tied to technology service companies are a great place to be for that for that uh, dynamic capital turnover competitive dynamic and the need to constantly 
uh, reinvent themselves to be relevant uh, to the industry. And do you think that'll be a rallying point for the service companies of today, the Halliburton, the Schlumberger, that's really struggling right now? Or is it going to be smaller new firms that are going to come up and establish themselves as service and tech? Well, it's, it's actually going to be both. Uh, the, the, the small startups uh, have uh, the the uh, an innovation um, uh, gene switched on pretty 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 high, um, and but what what they lack is often domain know how or domain expertise. So a small tech startup uh, collaborating with a customer is a match made in heaven because the customer's got the data and the business problem, and the startup has the expertise and the technical know how. The schlumbergers of the world also uh, appeal to that same market with added advantages. They've got huge scale, big sales forces. They know how to implement technology into large organizations, which small startups might not know how to do. So they're in a position to take innovation and, and move it forward. Yet another model is the, the slumberjays of the world purchasing and buying, acquiring tech startups to, to put them into their, uh, their portfolio of offering to take out to the industry because that ability to scale, sell, integrate is in and of itself a huge value for oil and gas customers. And very often it's hard to find that in a tech startup that, that just doesn't have the scale or the reach to be able to do that in a, in a large oil context. So it sounds like there's a future in the oil field, which is refreshing to hear amidst all the news today. <laughs> and it seems like that future is digital. So thank you again for joining us today. If you'd like to learn more about Jeffrey Can and the services he does provide, you can go to his website at jeffreycan.com, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y-C-A-N-N, and we'll be sure to link that in all of our material. And is there anything else you would like to plug, promote, speak about before we end this interview? Oh, uh, well, the two things that if you're, uh, if you're in the industry and you're interested in learning how digital will uh, uh, affect the industry, by all means, pick up my book, Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas. It uh, is, uh, appeals to anybody in the industry, service companies, upstream producers, midstream players, uh, retailers, wholesalers, capital project. It's in three formats. Uh, so classic paperback, which um, looks like this. If you kind of want to see what the cover looks like, looks like that. Uh, so paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Audible. Uh, and a client asked me to turn the book into a training course, which I've done. And the training course is on Udemy. It's about the same cost as the book, so it's pretty good value. Uh, but the training course is seven and a half hours of, of uh, lectures around uh, the ideas of the book and, and how the, the ideas of the book get uh, applied uh, to a, uh, in, the, in, the, in the course of the case, in the case of the course and to a case company. So you get the chance to apply it in, in a real world setting. All wonderful resources. And from what I've heard from people who have used them, great return on the value. So thank, thank you again. You. Yeah. And until we see you next time, everybody, take care. <laughs>